I'll let Jason introduce himself, but our facilitator today is uh, Jason Griso from, from uh, Polsky Center. Um, you'll be very happy to have him instead of me as a facilitator. I'm, I'm very confident in that. Um, but also, maybe since he doesn't know everybody, if everybody could just run around the room real quick and just sort of introduce yourself, um, that would be good. So let's start over this way. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris Pubek. Uh, I work at uh, Materials Engineering Research Facility, which is uh, part of the ES division. And in most cases, what we are doing over there is a service for others. Means that if the new material is, is invented, it goes to us, to us, and we try to develop uh, industrial process how to make this material. And actually, we make kilograms uh, of the material. We make the sample available to industry, so they they have the process on based on uh, which they can estimate the cost, and they have the actual material for prototyping validation. So the bulk give them the ability to make the right decision. Fantastic, thank you. Jan Kopez, um, CSC division in the fuel cell and hydrogen program. I'm trying to uh, expand our funding source from DOE to some uh, industrial partners uh, for fuel cell, mainly catalyst development, but also hydrogen storage uh, materials and hydrogen storage technologies. Let's get you. Janathan Borlawson from the Center for Transportation Research. My focus is internal combustion engines and also using machine learning to optimize uh, designs as well as processes. Sure. Okay. Uh, Shin, uh, event scientist at the uh, Energy Systems Division. So we will be looking at different event aspects of uh, products, uh, processes. So whenever there is a new technology or a new let's say, production process coming out, we will ask access to how uh, Right. So we have been working with industry, government, and uh, philosophy. I'm Volker Rose, and I'm a physicist with the Center for Non Nuclear Materials and the Advanced Work on Store CLR1. Uh, my work focuses on the development of novel types of X ray microscopy to understand materials at the length scale of single atoms and molecules. I'm Adam Szymanski. Um, I was in a previous session with you. Yeah. Yeah. So Talk about, but um, my background is um, I'm a computer scientist. I work in global security sciences. Um, I have a few different projects um, dealing with um, electronic warfare for the military, logistics modeling for the military, and um, drone detection and remote sensing. Okay. Uh, I'm Vinit Kumar Gadu. I'm a postdoc in nuclear engineering division, and I've been working in Oregon for four years as a grad student, six months as a postdoc. And I work on nuclear waste bombs, assessing the performance, the like corrosion performance of if you're basically predicting the lifetime for about 10,000, 100,000 years. But part of that, we are trying to use the skill set we developed and the knowledge we developed for nuclear waste forms. We are trying to apply it in different fields like biomaterials to start with. But we see that application is there in automotive, aerospace, and then can keep going on. So we're starting to look at biomaterials as a first aspect. So we're trying to get into it. Uh, I'm Haidel Ben from uh, X-ray Science Division. I'm a team one scientist at Sector 7. So uh, the research we are doing is basically understand how atoms and uh, electrons <coughs> work in materials on the, the intrinsic time scale. I'm Nina Kasman, I'm an X-ray science division as well, and um, I deal with crystal optics, but uh, I have a previous life before Argon. I like to connect the two and talk to other people outside in the real world. Uh, my name is Osman uh, Levant Arilmas. My background is material science. I work in the tribology group in the energy systems division. And my role in the group is mostly to develop uh, some surface coding technologies, surface technologies to improve efficiency or reliability of uh, moving components in transportation area mostly and also in manufacturing industries. Well, thank you all for your intros. Great to meet you. Maybe, maybe Annie, if you want to introduce yourself briefly. Yeah, sure. My name is Ani Sumant. Uh, I'm a material scientist who work at uh, Nanoscience and Technology Division, which is also called as a Center for Nanoscale Materials. I've been working at Argon from almost uh, 11 years now, and uh, my research interests mostly in carbon-based materials. And uh, I'm leading the research program at CNM 
in utilizing this carbon material to build the energy efficient systems, uh, whether it is related to electronic devices or whether it is related to the developing advanced coatings uh, for various industries. All right, one, one uh, late addition. Apologies for calling you out there, but maybe to introduce yourself to the group would be great. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Ed, Ed Barrett from the uh, ES Division. Um, last thing we worked on was an uh, oil sponge, a reusable sponge to absorb oil. Well, great. I appreciate uh, all of you spending time with us today and uh, hope it is valuable for you. Well, I guess more that remains to be seen at the end of the session. Um, maybe I can just lay out uh, what you can expect today and then I'll give you my, my background. So my hope for today, what I hope to accomplish, is to provide a little bit of content up front around what a value proposition is. I think you probably hear this term more and more these days. Um, it's a bit mystifying uh, often to me when you're trying to understand what someone's value proposition is. But uh, I'll take you through a little bit of content to try to lay the groundwork. And then Ani and uh, we'll have another edition. Tom will be here in about 15 minutes. We'll talk through their journey to actually understand what their value proposition could be to the marketplace. Um, and we'll try to bring that home back to research here at Argonne. I provided some materials. I, I believe you have a sheet in front of you. You'll get a PDF where all those links will actually be uh, clickable links uh, to resources that hopefully will help provide a little more background. And I'm happy to answer any questions after you read through those follow-up materials uh, and provide you with even, even more, right? maybe potentially more scientifically uh, focused examples. But that being said, happy to introduce myself. My name is Jason Pariso. I'm the director of the University of Chicago Innovation Fund. Uh, I think a couple of you actually even applied to the fund recently. Um, what we do is we provide proof of concept capital to spin-outs from the University, Argonne, Fermilab, and the Marine Biological Laboratory. The, uh, the idea there is once you're past government funding and you're trying to actually uh, create a company, create a technology that can be used out in the marketplace, there needs to be some capital to do that critical work to prove to someone that you can actually deliver value. Happy to talk about that uh, separately. Beyond that, I've been uh, helping with the NSF i program at the University of Chicago for quite some time. I run an associates program. And my, back, my previous life, I was a startup executive. So I've worked for a number of venture-backed uh, startup companies. I worked for a private equity firm briefly and uh, started my career as an investment banker in the media telecom space during the first internet boom and bust. So I have some stories there I can share later on as well. Um, but as to why we're here, we're here to talk about a value proposition. right? I think this is, again, very common language these days as startups have become uh, sexier out in the world. This has been used in business for quite some time. I think it's less well known in the scientific realm. Um, and the reason why I think it's important to understand is this is how your potential partners will think, right? But importantly, it's not your resume, right? Your value proposition to them is not who you are. It's not what your research is, right? It's not your body of work, unfortunately. Um, your value proposition describes how that person will benefit from working with you, right? Why do they care? They have limited resources. They have limited time. Their boss has, uh, you know, some big goal they're trying to hit that particular quarter. They have some big problems. Why should they spend any time with you at all, right? And your answer to that question is your value proposition. And when you think about structuring a value proposition, it is a combination of some of the things that you have, right? So how does your unique research capabilities here at the lab, and, and I would I think it would behoove you to think very broadly upon just beyond your own personal expertise. It's that plus the person sitting next to you that you know you work well with, plus the resources of the lab, plus a group across the lab. If you put those puzzle pieces together, um, usually the sum is more than the parts. And what could you potentially offer? What big problems that they have could you solve? And importantly, why would they choose to work with you over anyone else? Right? If, if they actually have the resources to do this, um, they probably have choices. They could work with a university. They could work with another company. They could work with an, uh, you know, some reputable individual that they know knows this particular space and this problem well. Why would they come to Argonne as opposed to going somewhere else? So to make it a little more visual, right, if you think of a, a bit of a Venn diagram of what are the really big business problems that they're willing to spend money on, and where does that overlap with what you think would be great science? And somewhere in the middle of that Venn diagram is a great project that, that's waiting to happen. We've used this in the uh, training program we ran here previously 
It's a very simple sheet to start just outlining what you think your value proposition is. And a good way to think about discovering your value proposition is um, it's probably not going to happen just by you thinking it up and writing it down. But the act of writing it down gives you something to go test. Right? So we have framed this, I think, quite well in the i at UChicago for many of our researchers that have gotten a lot of value out of the program. Uh, that this is essentially the scientific method for business. Right? State a hypothesis. Write it down. And the way you test these hypotheses is by talking to as many potential partners as humanly possible to understand their problems. If any of you are interested, I, I would encourage you to think about the i program, whether it's the DOE i for Energy or the uh, NSF i at the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship at UChicago, because we have an entire process that we run you through to train you how to, how to actually do this, how to go out into the wild, talk to as many potential partners as possible, and start to frame a value proposition. But for the purposes of today, I think we're going to focus on the conversations uh, with, with Tom and Ani. Um, however, if this will, again, this will be in slides. You'll have this as a PDF. It's a great place to start. You know, what are the critical capabilities that you have that you think separate you from others? And again, think broadly. Add other people to that list. What problems do you think you can solve? And focus on one. For whom? Right? The important part is who, do you have to, who are you going to go talk to now? You think I can solve X, Y, or Z for, a, uh, let's say, in the automotive industry? Probably not going to talk to Ford. Maybe. It's probably the, the parts supplier that's creating something for Ford or for GM or whoever the, the actual OEM might be. Talk to them about their problems and why you think your research can help them move the needle. And importantly, what benefits does it provide to them? So again, this, this is a, a bit of a summary on some of these, but um, a couple of things to think about while you're writing that down. Always think about what makes you different. Right? Because you, you've got to make them choose to work with you as opposed to someone else. What makes you different or better than them just doing this in-house with their own R&D? What makes you different or better than them finding an external, uh, an additional corporate partner, right? Or a university? Uh, what do you have access to here that they don't, right? That can also be critical, right? We have, we have a, a lot going on at Argon that is very differentiated, that is very expensive to replicate, that they don't have in-house. What does that allow you to do that they couldn't do without you? Um, and then again, always focusing on the impact you have on that partner. A couple of key learnings that we've had over the past four years now running the i program and working with teams here at LabCorp, now the, the Energy i um, Be really specific. Don't think broadly around why you're, you, know, you could serve the world. Think specifically about that partner or that type of partner. And then write that down. Because the faster you can have conversations and iterate what you originally thought to something closer to what they care about, the, the better off you will be. All right, that's a bit of a, we want to do is lay a little bit of groundwork just to set the stage so we're working with common language. And then we wanted to have a conversation with Tom and with Ani about their experience, right? So um, maybe we can talk a bit about the research, the work you've been doing with the external company. But we chose two different types of people. Tom, who has just recently, he's just completed a Launchpad program. So he's gone through some training. He's in the process of now building his value proposition, has had some great feedback and and has changed quite a bit along the way. So hopefully his conversation in a little bit will help elucidate the actual journey to get there. Um, and then on the flip side, we have Ani who's actually working with an external company to talk about that process, what it looked like, and how we actually found that partner. So I guess without any further ado, why don't we start with, um, again, I, you know, you introduce yourself, but why don't you uh, tell us a bit about the outside work that you're doing right now? Yeah, thanks, Jason. And uh, I'll get on to that question, but I just wanted to dwell on the the value proposition a little bit, if I may. Please. Uh, and it's very well explained, you know, by Jason. Uh, but, you know, your proposition actually built upon the value to begin with. And without a strong proposition, you know, there is no value to the value that you already have. So, so those two words are very, very interdependent and, and depends upon each other. So, uh, you know, and just to break it down into very simple terms, so the value Let's say if you are the fastest super company in the world, you know, that's value. Uh, but what you are doing with it, you know, why other people are going to come and work with you, you know, that depends upon, you know, your proposition, your credibility, and how you are actually, you know, using that value uh, to work with others. So I think this is very important. And, and when you are working, you know, at Argonne, there is already a component value associated with it. But 
you know, what you do with it, how effectively you use it, you know, and how you show uh, that it is going to be useful or beneficial for your partners, you know, that is the value proposition. Uh, so getting on to the, you know, uh, the work that I have been doing, uh, I mean, uh, doing with the various industries partner from you know, many years, and there are many stories, uh, but I just wanted to, you know, uh, pick a uh, few of the stories that actually resulted into the um, you know, two uh, DOE programs uh, that we have right, right now working on it. And, and um, it all depends upon first, I said, you know, value. Uh, and, and that based on our research, you know, that we have been doing at Argon with the facilities that nobody else has. Uh, and and uh, just to give an example, the work on the super lubricity that we have done in the last you know, few years is, is related to how you, know, you can reduce the friction to near zero value. And that has a tremendous you know, application potential in many different areas. In uh, tribology, for example, and I think uh, you know, Osman works in that area, so he knows very well. Uh, and then once you know, we have created that value, that was paper was published in Science, and everywhere, and then we have you know big patent portfolio around it. Uh, the company actually approached us. Uh, in one case, uh, they wanted to work with us uh, to see how that could be utilized for their application. One of the company, John Crane, they actually uh, one of the largest company uh, where they use their uh, pump seal for reducing friction. So they wanted to utilize this technology how it will be you know useful for them. So then. What happens is the conversation between them. Uh, they came here, you know, and then their interaction with the Argon, uh, and then with us, uh, led us to believe, or led them to believe that, okay, this is a good technology. And then we ended up, you know, submitting uh, uh, a DOE program, which is called Technology Commercialization Fund, and, you know, winning that program. So that's, you know, one example. And another example that happened in a very different way uh, so I, I generally go to the conferences, and I think these conferences, you know, it's very important to do some homework uh, before you go to the conferences. Uh, Tech Connect is one of such conferences uh, that I would suggest you to, you know, go because there are many companies that comes to this conference, and and, and there is a, you know, you can actually talk with them uh, regarding various, uh, you know, research that you have been doing, and if let's say the work that you are doing you know, is related to them, you know, they will contact you in advance. Or you can, you know, uh, select them and have a conversation with them at the booth there. So I was talking with one of the company there, uh, which is, is a Magna, and, and, and I think uh, Osman also, you know, won one of the awards with Magna. And, and um, so they were interested in the research that, you know, uh, I was doing. And through the conversation, uh, you know, then, they you know, find out that what Argon capability you know, has, and then they they come to visit us, and then you know there are a series of meeting, discussion, and then that led to another TCA program. So you know it takes time. I mean, it took almost one year before you know we come to the discussion to get an award and starting the work. So there is a lot that goes you know around it, and I think it all depends upon first you know using the value that you have. Uh, or you know whatever existing capability that you know creating a value out of it, and then uh, the rest of the things is really working with them and what do we have to offer to them so that you know they can come and work with you. Well, I mean, maybe I can ask you some questions to tease out some parts there because there's there's a lot in there. Um, was that company Euclid Tech? Was that the one you're mentioning? Just well, no, that is related to another technology that we sure. have developed that was related to the diamond thinking technology. So, so, uh, so uh, in case of Euclid, uh, that was the third uh, TCA program that we have got, but it was, uh, you know, type one, uh, not the, uh, you know, the bigger one. Uh, but in that- well, let me pause and what, uh, let's talk about the company you met at the conference. What, what was the name of the company? Oh, uh, that was the Magna. Magna, gotcha. And so, um, and again, what was the underlying technology that they ended up being interested in? Yeah, so uh, the super lubricity, you know, yep. technology that we have developed by utilizing graphene and other 2D materials for reducing friction. Yeah. So that's where they're interested in. And I, just to give you an example, you know, what they do uh, is uh, Magna is uh, one of the largest company in uh, in automotive you know, marketing. And and what they do is uh, they use uh, metal forming, you know, technology. So whatever 
carve different shapes that you see and that is the result of you know you do the metal forming stamping of the metal in a specified you know, shape uh, and that you know gives you that particular shape uh, so it turns out that you know it's a metal metal contact when they do that and it happens at uh, you know little elevated temperature and what they use is some kind of conventional oil based lubricants or even some you know uh, solid lubricants which are not environmentally friendly so, so beyond the environmental impact what are the, what are the other challenges that you found out they have with those lubricants yeah i mean for any company the cost is first you know the major factor and then the rest of the credibility that comes with the safety and then the environmental impact so the cost of course is a major factor so uh, in case of the conventional lubricants they were using they have to you know remove that lubricants uh, so that they can spray paint and and that associated everything with the cost so what they you know found out during the conversation with us is that if we use our coating technology you know to their uh, you know manufacturing process then the whole cost factor is going to significantly reduce uh, and not only that but also it is impact on the safety you know of the passenger vehicles so that was also intermingled in there so so and, based so why, why, and why was the cost reduced? I don't know if you... Yeah, so the cost reduction factor is, again, you know, related if you use oil-based or other lubricants, uh, in order to do the spray printing process nicely, you have to remove that. So if any oil contamination remain on your surface, uh, that can degrade the paint quality. And, and uh, you will not like your, you know, if you buy a brand new car, and after a few months you see that the paint is, you know, failing. So, so they have to be very, very cautious about when they use this paint process, you know, it sticks nicely. Uh, so, but by using our technology, you know, they, they saw that there is a promise that they, they may not have to do a very stringent cleaning process at all. And maybe there is a possibility that even their coating will be uh, more strong. Uh, and so that was the main, uh, main cost reduction factor. And did, did you know that before Magna showed up that, you, that this was going to be an application for your technology? Well, actually, uh, quite frankly, not. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when uh, I talk with, with them, uh, just through the uh, introduction, and, and uh, you know, I was talking with one of their technology scout, you know, person, and, and uh, I said that, yeah, we are working on, you know, completely eliminating oil, you know, with our technology. And he said, oh, I like that. And then we started talking about, uh, you know, what are the benefits, and. And so it, it, it's, you know, started getting more deeper and deeper conversation. And then at that time, he said that this is a very good technology. Let me involve, you know, our technical experts in that. And then, you know, they arranged a visit. Uh, we arranged a visit, uh, you know, for them to come here. They would talk with their technical experts. And, and they even did, you know, the, some of the simulation uh, with, uh, with the, uh, you know, uh, conversation with us and everything. And, and uh, we also ended up doing some uh, preliminary test uh, on on their samples, so everything you know that was you know going on uh, in conversation with them that led you know them to believe that that this this is really the technology that would be useful for them. Interesting. Anyone have? And sorry, you guys can chime in with questions, or at least we'll open up to questions for it, please. Can I ask maybe a similar question in terms of the science? Were you producing, it, or were you demonstrating at a scale that? They yeah, the scale is, of course, you know, is uh, because we are national labs, you know, we do basic research and we cannot show to the industrial scale. So when we talk with them, they already know, you know, that this has to be, you know, scale up. Uh, so what is important for them is whether there is enough potential to go forward. And, and I think, uh, you know, we also do some sort of intermediate step. I mean, for example, we are not like a university where we can do research on, you know, few samples. Uh, on you know, one centimeter, we can do it on much larger area. I think you already know from your work on the oil, you know. So, of course, you cannot do it on larger scale, but you can do it on intermediate scale, and that is very valuable for the industry. So, based on that, I think they can, you know, forecast whether this is more suitable or not. There's a couple things just to highlight there that I think were really informative. One is. You didn't know when they showed up, right? It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't like you had something, in your, some game winner in your back pocket, and you the exact company to talk to. It was you were really a learning process to understand yeah. how what you had fit with what they needed. Yeah. And I think importantly, what they don't care about is actually friction. Right? I mean, they 
it's part of the process, but that's not what actually drives them to work with you. What drives them to work with you is saving a ton of money on paint jobs, right? That's, that's the benefit to them. Yeah. Um, even the oil is somewhat irrelevant, right? If there was a, a simpler way to strip it that was less costly than what you're working on, they would probably continue to do it the way they're currently doing. Yeah, and another important thing, you know, regarding the safety that I mentioned is, is uh, you know, when they have this metal-metal contact, what happens, uh, this is a little bit more technical, but I, I guess everybody would understand, is that uh, when the lubrication is lost, you know, what happens with the metal is the extra thinning of the metal at the contact. And that's a weak point for your, you know, body of your car. So in, a, in an impact, you know, there is more probability that it will tear off from that weak point. So if you reduce the friction evenly everywhere, you know, then you reduce that possibility. So that's related to the safety vehicle. So I mean, safety aspect of the vehicle. So that will also be important. Yeah. What was the setup of your initial interaction with them? Were you presenting a technical paper or like how? Yeah, I mean, situation? yeah, that's that's a very important question. Uh, yeah, I was giving an invited talk in, in one of the sessions there. And I think one of the representative from that company was, you know, at the talk. And, and uh, after my talk, actually, they came to me and they said that, yeah, that looks interesting, why don't we talk more? And that's how the interaction started. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, sometime your initiative is also important. It's always good if, uh, you know, you are there in a much broader capability uh, so that, you know, the other can see you, uh, but that not necessarily required. I mean, you can even look for the companies which are working in your area and send an email that, you know, this is the technology that we have, whether you want to talk. You know, that's. So another question on the business before, and what, what's the outcome? Are they going to implement it for their own use? You know, because they're going to code the tools themselves, right? The stamping tools. Or are they, or do, do you need like a third party intermediary that would, whose core business would be basically doing codings for? Yeah, no, I think, you know, this, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. So uh, this is a big company, it's a $30 billion you know, uh, company. So uh, what they are always looking for. Is, is the, you know, uh, the breakthrough technology that, you know, nobody has. And uh, so that they will, they have, a, you know, competitive edge, uh, you know, as compared to the, their others. Um, and they have all the facility. Once they know that this, you know, system works, this technology works, then, you know, they have capability to do everything in-house. So they so, want to, they have the capacity to Yeah, to and, and that's how the, the, uh, the TCA project is built upon, and the deliverables are actually the commercialization of this technology. So the DOE's TCA program is, I think, is one of the, the most you know, important program uh, for a researcher uh, you know, from national labs, because uh, there is less risk on the industry side, because they don't have to put their you know, money directly from their pocket. Uh, but at the same time, if there is a technology available at National Lab, they get to test it, they get to use it, and if it works nicely, then they can transfer the technology. So it's, a, it's an excellent program. So you're, you're, the second one we talked about uh, was from a, you found that company in a very different way, right, Euclid. So maybe you can tell a bit, uh, talk a bit about how Euclid, the Euclid partnership happened. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, since CNM is a user facility, uh, we get to see uh, users from you know, many different parts, uh, either from academic, you know, industry, uh, and, and uh, so the Euclid is one of the company that actually I get to know uh, through user program. So since we had a capability, uh, you know, in, in a diamond area to deposit diamond on large area and, you know, showing their application in different aspects, and in particular this company was interested in field emission uh, for making an efficient electron source for the miniaturized accelerators. Uh, and the, uh, the side application was also, once you demonstrate that you can have efficient solid state electron emitters, which could be used for, you know, for uh, isotope, uh, you know, modification, for maybe, you know, security sensing, like X-ray imaging, uh, for medical diagnosis and everything. Uh, 
so through the user program, you know, they wrote a proposal, you know, and then they passed along the criteria and then uh, tested the capability of our system as well as, you know, the materials, which is a uh, dynamic person and diamond. They got excellent results. We, you know, published few papers, few patents. Um, and then, you know, they, they saw that this is really, you know, interesting technology. Uh, and, and then together we, uh, you know, won uh, a couple of SBIR awards. Uh, so at that point, you know, I said that this is really good, so we have to go something big. Uh, really demonstrate a product, you know, out of it. And, and at the same time, the TCF, uh, you know, uh, solicitation came through, and then we applied for it, and then uh, won the program. So we already, at the end of this program, we have already, you know, shown that uh, we fabricated an electron source based on this material and, and tested it, you know, at uh, some of the facilities, and, and it's working nicely. So. This is another avenue, since we are at the you know, user facility, yeah. and that's how we get introduced. Maybe, maybe we can go in a, a little bit deeper on this one then. So they, they applied, right, because there's facilities here that they, don't have, they couldn't get access to anywhere else, right? It's a pretty unique ability to do that work here at Argonne. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the Argonne is known from more than, you know, uh, 20 years now in the area of specifically the UNCD technology. And so that's, and there is also a company actually spin out spin off out of you know Argon advanced diamond technology uh, but uh, the the this particular work was on the nitrogen doped you know UNCD which uh, nobody can produce uh, you know other than the uh, the Argon and and the uh, the export is in this area so that's how they, they approached us and so um Maybe go one step farther there, though. So, what, what were the metrics that they were trying to hit with this? You know, what, why were they trying to min miniaturize this source, and what were the metrics they had to hit here? Yeah, I mean, you know, in accelerator community, I'm not the accelerator, you know, physicist, but you know, in the accelerator community, the big goal is, I mean, this is again a very big goal is that instead of having, you know, a facility like APS, can we have an accelerator on a tabletop? So, and that started, I think, uh, you know, in Stanford University, uh, where, you know, they, they had some experiment and produced, you know, a chip, you know, uh, where they have shown the capability by using lasing action, you can produce an electron beam uh, that could be essentially, you know, used and as a X-ray source. So there's a lot of interest in the accelerator community in order to reduce the size of these big synchrotron machines you know, into like a tabletop machine. Of course, it's a very far-reaching, well, there are a lot of, you know, problems and things, but the, the offshoot of that is that if you have an efficient electron source, uh, it can be used for many other applications, because once you have electron, you can produce X-ray, um, and that X-ray can do many different things. For example, you know, at a security screening, you know, checking metal objects uh, for medical diagnosis, uh, big medical diagnosis, uh, also for isotope production and things. Uh, so there are many such applications if you have a low cost, uh, uh, efficient electron source. Because the conventional one is based on the thermionic emission, which requires more power, uh, and more costly. Uh, and so what is, uh, what is Euclid intending to do with the technology? Yeah, so the Euclid, you know, main intention is to uh, you know, of course, spend big pictures, uh, you know, in terms of the reducing the size you know, of the accelerator, but at the same time, you know, uh, their you know, low-hanging fruits are this, is that to produce an electron source that can be, you know, used for either medical diagnosis or, you know, for security screening. So gotcha. th that, that's the, the main objective, and, and now we are going step by step. So we already fulfilled one, uh, which was the DC, uh, you know, TCF goal of really showing the conventional uh, electron source, which is based on the laser, uh, uh, which is now replaceable by the field emission based on, based on that. The, the thing I'm trying to highlight there is a, different, a very different type of value proposition, right? This is more research based, but at the end of the day, what they care about is small. Yeah, right? they, I mean, this is, I mean, kind of a game changing, you know, for them is because. First, it replaces the thermionic, you know, based, which is uh, costly, uh, and then also in terms of accuracy. Uh, the other one is laser-based, which is, you know, much better, but then you need, 
you know, a room like this to have that kind of laser and all the complicated assembly. Uh, but instead now you completely shrunk down to a small plug size like this. Uh, so in terms of cost, uh, in terms of you know, reproducibility and everything, uh, this is much better. Well, excellent, thank you. Does anyone have any questions on Euclid? The, the thing I wanted to highlight there is it's a very different, very, very different value proposition, right? From Magna, which has a going process. They're producing car parts every day. And they had a cost problem with removing something that exists in, an, in a process today. Versus this company, which is trying to blaze a new trail and build an entirely new product, um, and has a much probably closer to the science type of problem of can we make something that works at all? Right? Because without, without this piece of technology that you're working on, they don't have a product, right? You don't have a, a miniaturized electron gun that you can use in airport security, wherever the right application might be. Um, but understanding those, the difference between those two is pretty important, right? I think Euclid is um, probably more dependent upon you and potentially even yeah, more engaged, company, yeah. right? Uh, versus uh, Magna, yeah. who the sun will rise, another day comes, they'll stamp out another X number of car parts. Um, you will help them be more competitive but their business isn't dependent upon you. However, right, if you can demonstrate to them you know, multi-million dollars of savings in a paint application over time, they will they'll also be able to cut bigger checks for what's worth. Sorry, I don't mean to miss this, but with yeah. initiating the conversation with you with the same with Magnet, did, were you able to approach them saying, do we have this value, or was it No, I think, you know, as I said, with the Euclid, you know, it's a user. And so since they are based on Bolingbroke, you know, they know about Argon. And so, you know, they applied for the user proposal. You know, I didn't know them initially, but, you know. Maybe we can talk a bit about that conversation with you, though, right? Because I'm assuming they could have worked with other researchers if they were so inclined. Um, tell us a bit about the, those initial conversations. Yeah. That one. I mean, uh, you know, first of all, when the company approaches you, you know, it's not like blindly. They do their homework. You know, they know everything, what you're doing. And uh, so use of diamond for field emission is not new. Uh, it's been known from last, you know, 20 years or so. Uh, so when you apply the voltage, you know, to the diamond because of the negative electron affinity that you have, you can eject the electron out, you know, quite easily. Uh, and why diamond is because diamond is robust. It works in, you know, very adverse condition. Uh, and that's why the promise of using diamond as a field emitter is known. But the question was, you know, up till now, whatever all the work which is done, there is always problem with the stability. And uh, with only the UNCD technology which is developed at Argon, you know, we have shown that the stability, you know, is excellent. And there are reasons for that, you know, scientific reasons which are already published, you know, we already have patents and everything. So they knew that this is the technology, you know, that could be useful for them. And with that, you know, assumption that they approached but you know they were not expert in that technology, uh, and and that's why they also needed not only the capability, but the knowledge you know, around it. And I think that was the most important criteria for them, you know, to approach us and work with us. And then you know, and since we did not, I mean, of course, uh, for us, you know, we don't know. I mean, at least you know, for myself, we don't know anything about the accelerator technology. So I learned a lot in the accelerator physics, you know, community why it is needed you know, how it could be useful. And in fact, once I, you know, knew that, you know, I came up with, you know, even more new ideas. So it was kind of a, you know, mutual uh, understanding and knowledge sharing. And that really helped, you know, both of us in, in really taking the technology and to the next level. How open are the scouts or industry partners when they approach you? Um, I mean, at some point, they will know what you have to offer at some level. Yeah and they might ask you about that, but there might be deeper questions, and I'm wondering, you know, are, are they asking everything because that might, uh, you know, put open some of the maybe future developments they're working on and don't yeah. want to share with you at that level. So, do they give you questions about stuff that you haven't answered yet? Yeah, I mean, I want to be honest with you. You know, you have to be very careful, uh, and, and I don't want to, you know, you know, uh, paint a rosy picture here. Every time anyone, technology scout, asks you, 
that not necessarily with the good intention. You know, sometime they already figured out and they want something to fill in and they want to go to the expert and talk about that uh, and really wants to, you know, scavenge the information. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, you have to believe that, you know, there are some genuine people out there. Uh, they want to solve the problems. Uh, and, you know, if they see the value, they see the, you know, population, they really work with you. So you have to go with open mind, you know, talk with them. Uh, but at the same time, make sure that, you know, you, you, you secure your technology, be professional, uh, but, you know, make sure that you don't get, you know, your hands burned in the process. Uh, because there are, you know, things uh, that I already experienced, <laughs> and and uh, the the experience actually, you know, you know, teach you new things. So it's important. So keep you know open mind, talk with them what you have to offer, and I think if they're genuine, then they really work. With you. But they do not necessarily guide you into like those wide or gray areas where they have open questions. They don't know much or anything about it. And ask you, can you do something in that direction? They're just waiting until you have something to offer, until you have the value, right? Yeah, I mean, see, what is important for them is, is the product, right? I mean, if they come up with the product which is better than anybody else, you know, they will do it. Uh, they will work with you. And, and once they know that you have value, you have something that really benefits them, they will, you know, do out of, you know, their own comfort vision. So, okay, I think, the, I think the question you're asking is, Maybe what I'm hearing is, you know, do they show up and ask you the question that leads you right to what your value to them is? Is that, um, and in my experience, that's pretty rare. And may, maybe you could say differently. It really is an exploratory conversation because they don't know you well. They they may have done their background research, but they don't know you well enough and what you're working on and what you're thinking and what you could do to say, oh, I've got the perfect problem if you could just do X, Y, or Z. And it's unlikely you know them well enough to know all of their problems and can walk up and say, oh, there's, there's three of your top ten problems I could probably solve if you show up to my lab. It really is um, building relationship, building a deep conversation, asking way more questions and listening um, as opposed to talking about what you're actually working on. Uh, what, are, what are your top problems in manufacturing now? What are, and you obviously try to ask questions in a related field you think you might be able to add value to, but understanding their problems should be your first order of business. And the more of those kind of conversations you have with the broadest set of potential partners, the closer you will get to, okay, I think there's something here that we could do that would be really exciting for both of us. But it is it is a long conversation. Welcome, sir. Tom. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. No, no worries. I'll give you a moment to get settled in, and then we'll, we'll bombard you with questions. I have yeah. one last question. We're to be switching. Yeah, yeah. Why don't, we, yeah. why don't we put a pin in this one? This is a little too uh, specific and off topic. We'll talk about it after the session. Yeah. Yeah. And there is actually the practical example happened exactly with the United Scientific that we were working with. So uh, before the uh, the patent was awarded, they actually licensed it, and and now it is awarded. So uh, this is for one of the nanotechnology educational field. So we can talk about yeah. that later. Yeah. yeah, we do that a lot. Thank you. Tom, well, welcome aboard. Thanks Hello. for uh, taking yeah. time out this Sorry. afternoon. Not a problem. I know you had, you had a meeting before this, but um, we, we'll pause with you and e for a bit, and we'll, we'll come back to it and have a, a wider range of conversation. But I thought it would be great to bring Tom as well to talk about his experience in the Launchpad program 
as someone who's, who's really now looking outside of the lab and has spent a lot of time thinking about his value proposition to other partners. But before we dive in that deep, why don't you introduce yourself to the, to the room and, and I'll start asking questions. Sure, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Tom Wall. I'm in, in GSS, or, or the division formerly known as GSS, soon when it's <laughs> EGS does its reorg. Um, my launchpad program was focused on uh, climate change impacts and how can climate change, uh, all the climate change research that goes on in Argonne be applied in the infrastructure sector. So my background is in civil engineering, I'm not a climate scientist, but in my launchpad effort I partnered with Yan Feng who is, who is a climate scientist in EBS. And so the two of us set out to see what, what was unique about what Argonne was doing in climate science, uh, climate data generation, climate modeling especially with a lot of really high resolution, high detailed climate data, uh, and then applying that in sort of decision science and engineering decision making in the electric power sector, in GSS we also work in global security, so we were looking at defense and intelligence sectors um, and how could they potentially make use of climate data, and then we were also working a little bit with emergency management and emergency planning. So is everyone here familiar with the Launchpad program? Seeing no nods or hands. <laughs> Maybe you can say <laughs> just very up. briefly sure. about uh, Launchpad. So Launchpad was an effort. Uh, it was uh, originally started called the uh, Program Development Rotation. So if I slip and say PDR, it's the same thing as Launchpad. Uh, it was um, created in TCP, TCP, TDC, TCP, uh, which which are also the same thing. A lot of acronyms and. Uh, <laughs> And it was an effort where they covered my time for up to 50% for uh, one fiscal year to explore program development in the space that I proposed. So I think there were a dozen or so applications and four, three and a half of us were selected. It started off as three and then a fourth was added in later. Um, and so I got to work with Yan and go out to conferences to talk with uh, potential sponsors or just other people in the industry to sort of explore their use of climate data and climate information decision making. Um, and, and really, and what I think we're talking about today, start developing a value proposition for what Argonne could bring to that space and then through more and more conversations with people to really refine or hone or evolve that value proposition or develop new ones as we work with different types of potential sponsors or different sectors. So you mentioned three sectors that you Kind of your original hypothesis, right, was that uh, you'd be very valuable to EMS, to intelligence, and to and to the grid. Yeah. Um, and you had, you had a lot of conversations out there with with companies, with other researchers, with engineers. Um, so maybe maybe we'll start with uh, start with the bad, right? Which uh, which one fell away and why? Well, we didn't. Uh, we really didn't get an opportunity to engage with the emergency management or emergency planning sector in a meaningful way. So. That's probably the least successful, but we also didn't really push it. So yeah. um, I would say that electric power was interesting. We There's the, the master crater with Exelon that was signed not too long before uh, I started the effort. So we really started talking with Exelon and major power companies. Um, and we were also in, engaged in an effort with uh, DOE's EPSA, the Energy Policy and Systems Analysis Group. Um, who had convened, I think, 16 utilities to get together and sort of discuss climate resilience. And I'm going to, I'll, yeah. I'll apologize, I'll, I'll jump in and out to try sure. to help guide the conversation a bit, but um, so what did you, like, what was your initial hypothesis to why the power companies would want to work? Sure. We thought, um, so I used to, my background is more in transportation infrastructure, going to transportation conferences, going to some power conferences. Uh, I kept hearing the comment, well, if we could just get the climate scientists and the engineers in the same room and talking together, we could, we could move forward in a meaningful way. And so that was what I started with as our value proposition of how could we provide data that was, because um, they sort of, the two groups speak different languages really. And so how could we provide climate data and climate information <coughs> that was scientifically sound and, and generated with sophisticated modeling and, and uh, but could be provided to engineers in a, a meaningful or actionable way. Um, how could they base new designs or decision making on that data? And the initial thinking was, based upon what we heard at conferences, well, if we just give them data that is in a way that they can use it or a way that, or what they need, they'll start making use of it. And that wasn't really 
what we found. Yeah, so that, that to quickly summarize, right? Because it makes sense when you say it out loud. That's the, what, I, what I'm trying to get across here. If you just say out loud, hey, they need data around climate to do these things, we might have the best in the world and we've got the best modeling and all these other things, which means we'll have the best data set. Why wouldn't they love that? Makes sense, right? Yeah. And then... Because they work for, they work in a business. Yeah. <laughs> and so how does, uh, how, do, how does this affect their, their business operations or their business plans? And so then we found, all right, well, it's, we can make it useful to the engineers, but if we can't tie that to how, our, how does that inform business decisions and the profitability of these companies, which is their profit-driven private companies, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's not going to be successful. And so we then started looking at how can we come up with broader, or speaking in the language of risk and risk-based decision making, because that is consistent with a lot of sort of business plans uh, and 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 business practices. A lot of these companies. Um, we've started looking at what are the major metrics that affect the electric sector. Uh, one of the big ones is reliability. A lot is driven by reliability and decision making. So, and that's that's something that we actually discovered through our work with EPSA, which didn't really come. Not a lot of funding came along with that. It was more just we got to be present in the room while 16 utilities were talking openly about planning for climate change and climate resilience, um, and they're all driven by reliability. So okay, how could we take what we're doing with climate and, and put that in terms of reliability or their current business practices? And, and um, for political reasons, climate was a less uh, successful topic moving forward. So the work with the electric sector kind of stalled out for some of those reasons as well. And so then you had your, your third market, intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, that was one um, that really arose out of trying to look at what are Argonne's unique capabilities. And uh, we have classified facilities here. Um, we have some unique capabilities in those classified facilities um, that put us on a pretty short list of people who have services that we could offer the intelligence community. You know, a, a public university is not as well positioned to engage in a meaningful way with the intelligence community and provide support to them, but we already have relationships with people in, in, in defense and intelligence spaces uh, and security spaces, um, and and some of them are concerned about these longer term global stability problems that could be affected by climate, um, and so we we were already on a short list of people who could even talk to them and engage with them in a meaningful way, and found that that put us in a pretty good position to try and pursue work with them further. Sorry, I can't give more concrete detail. No, that is a, the nature of the work. downside of the intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it, it, the, again, I think the reason why your examples are, are particularly interesting, right, is that you had a reasonably well-formed and thoughtful hypothesis when it came to working with power utilities, which makes sense off the cuff, and you realize that um, you're, it was incomplete, right? It was directionally correct, but incomplete. Yeah. Yes, they need the data, but what they really need is an understanding of how, impact to their reliability statistic because I believe they're actually paid based on reliability or fined, whatever the yeah, yeah. The, the, the latter. Yeah. yeah. So driving that like the value to them is lower fines. Yeah. Like increased reliability matters to them because they don't get dinged by their local or, or state government and have to pay back some amount of money. Yeah. And I guess if I step back and like as an engineer think like my first hypothesis was very good engineering hypothesis. It was sort of straight line, very logical and then I step back and have to realize that they operate in a business environment which is less familiar to me, um, and there, there are political forces which are less familiar to me. So I, I think one of the challenges and one of the things I really learned a lot about in the Launchpad effort was trying to balance uh, all of those competing uh, priorities or forces in, in engaging with these people in a meaningful way. It's a, a good kind of... Um, dichotomy here, right? we have uh, someone who has multiple external partners now and has found the value proposition, someone who um, is still in search of, right, is maybe the way to put it, right? You have, because of political reasons, one that maybe not as, um, may, may come back in the future and will likely have to deal with that particular issue regardless, but is maybe less willing to put dollars out right now. 
Um, however, you know, it's not like you're going to stop working on this. Where, where, where do you think you go from here? What's your next, your next focus area? So that's why I was late to this meeting, because we yeah. were talking about that over at EBS. Um, and I think that um, there are other agencies or other sectors that we could talk with. We could talk with people in the agricultural space. We could talk with people in uh, sort of uh, biology and ecology, um, which are, you know, not, not as familiar to me. They're not my, it's not my area of expertise. Um, but we can talk about certainly decision making and decision support is an area that I have some expertise in so we can figure out how to you know, engage with them in partnership with EBS, which I think will be important. And I, it's worth, bears mentioning that like none of this would have been successful without, if I, if I was trying to do this on my own as, as originally proposed, because the launch pad, I applied, someone from EBS applied, they said, hey, why don't you work together? And that was a really smart decision because I, if I were trying to do all of this on my own without direct engagement with EBS, it would have been nowhere near as successful. Um, so those are some spaces. I, I really uh, am still pursuing actively in sort of the defense and intelligence space because I think that that's um, a pretty pragmatic group and and, uh, and I think that we can you know, still push forward even given the current times. Um, we talk a lot to insurance and reinsurance industry. Uh, I think that's something that we never got to fully explore but is something that we pursue. So there, there's lots and lots of other sectors that I think that we can um, we can work with, a lot of them are private uh, because they may not be as influenced by um, some of the political appearances of, of what we're doing. Excellent. Please, well, we'll start with uh, Volker, we'll come back to you. Yeah. Uh, you were showing this two-dimensional plot at the beginning where it's me and then there's a customer and the overlap, but I think this is all like a little bit more three-dimensional, multi-dimensional. So I'm wondering for both of you, how much effort do you spend on increasing your value but in, in doing what, what you do better or maybe better align with your customer and understand what they want versus investing your time in understanding what's out there with the competition that also might serve that customer. So how much do you observe others in the field to try to get better or more unique or maybe even try to align with them to be, you know, to raise your value. So I'm wondering how you strategically approach them? Yeah, I'll go with, you know, first. Um, yeah, I think it, it all depends upon, you know, uh, what you're doing and, and then be cognizant about if there are any external partners who are already working in this area. I'll give you an example uh, working with Corning. So, uh, you know, we were actually working on developing diamond coating, you know, at low temperature. And this was a DARPA project that we had from, I think, five years back. So we developed the whole technology of, you know, uh, developing uh, a CMOS-based, you know, RF MEMS devices based on diamond at low temperature. And, and uh, during that process, you know, uh, I was interested in, so I, I did actually deposition on some of the glass wafers that we had, and uh, which had excellent properties. So uh, with, uh, you know, when I came to know about Corning Gorilla Glass and everything that they are doing, uh, and they are looking for, you know, some kind of alternative uh, with the uh, sapphire, uh, which is, you know, uh, expensive than the Gorilla Glass, um, but, it's, you know, better, uh, and then looking for, you know, alternative. So I approached them, and they said that, you know, we have the technology that we can produce, you know, a very thin film of, you know, diamond on glass at low temperature. So they liked that, and, and, and we had one, you know, TSA with them, in really looking at, you know, the properties of uh, the diamond coating on, you know, their glass. And, and it's ongoing right now, and maybe you know, it will turn into another TCF program. But I think it all depends upon you. I mean, um, if, if I am not thinking about applying this to, you know, a company like Corning, that may not have happened. So, uh, and I don't have to spend my time looking at whether, you know, there is any application out there so it's really up to you to see what technology that you have and whether it's useful for you know any other partners and sometimes you don't know like like for example Mac and I didn't even know that you know this could be useful for that application they approached us I mean you know we got into talking with them and then I learned so it's, it's really you know up to you and see how different technology that you have and how you can connect with others so, I'm not sure. Maybe I can circle back to your question. I, I 
think what I heard you asking is, how much should you change what you're focused on given what is out there and what people care about? Is that right? I think the, the value is determined by two things. It's like the customer out there is determining how valuable I am for that certain project. Uh, my value also depends on what's kind of my level, what's available for that customer. Mm -hmm. Right? So I can either increase my value by better aligned to that problem, or I have new solutions for that problem, or I'm extremely valuable because I'm so much better than my competition. But that means I have to screen them, screen them also very well. In addition to my, my customer, I really have to know what's going on around me. Right? There's other people that might offer solutions to the customer. And I'm wondering strategically, do they spend a lot of time on really looking what's the problem, how do I better align, or are you guys looking around? You know, what are other labs or other groups doing, and, and why I'm better, why I'm potentially more valuable than they are in the market? So yeah, I think we, um, so we did both. Uh, we, I, I personally spent a lot more time trying to figure out what we could offer, how that would could best align with the, the needs within industry. Um, but we, both Yan and EBS and I brought a lot of knowledge already from just doing work in, in these in our respective spaces to know a little bit already of what the competition looked like. So I think. Had we not had that when we were going into this effort, we probably would have spent more time on that. Um, but because we both had sort of an idea of which other labs are we competing against, but also uh, what private companies are we competing against. Um, having said that, though, I think that there is there are opportunities where you can do both simultaneously. And the one example I give is I went to a conference, a climate leadership conference was conveniently in Chicago this last year, or I guess it was 20, it was a year ago. Um, and so I went there, and there's lots of people from, uh, uh, well, I guess would-be sponsors or, or would-be funders of this, but there's also a lot of other people like me trying to figure out who can pay for what I want to do. Uh, and so you get an opportunity to talk to both. And that gave me the chance to see, all right, how can we better align what we're trying to do uh, with what people, what, what industry needs, but how can we also differentiate ourselves from, from the competition? And even in, like in one case, there was a, a private company that's sort of an environmental consulting firm who also does some work in the infrastructure space, um, and, and they like really wanted to partner with us. And it seemed like it could be a great opportunity. And so we set up some calls, and I, John, I don't know if you were on that call, or I know Usha was on the call, and, and um, it turned out that they were really more of a competitor and they just wanted our data so they could use that to do what we were proposing to do in the effort, which was add value on top of that data and information and work with uh, the energy sector to better inform decision making. So that was an interesting one because that, that engagement sort of ran the full spectrum of, oh, this is great, we've got really unique capabilities to well, really, we're competing against one another in the space, but we have we, do, we still have the data, which is a unique edge that, that Argonne had in that case, which I think was still a, a beneficial outcome of that whole engagement. Yeah, and I'd like to speak to that a little bit as well, because I think there, you know, one of the things that we did in Launchpad, and Tom can speak to that pretty well as well, you know, we tried to do, you know, benchmarking is a big part of that, is trying to understand, again, where do we play, um, what strengths do we have? Or, you know, typically it's other labs or other institutions that are doing similar research. Um, there's always the, you know, there's always the what magic tools do we have that others don't, right? Not everybody has APS or CNM, those types of things. But, you know, so the, there's a benefit in doing that to see where, where, where are we in that playing field and are we better or worse? Where do we need to do stuff, right? There's that aspect of it. But there's also, and I think you spoke to that a little bit as well, there's also some areas where you may look and you may say, boy, we're, the, you know, we're by far the best in this particular space, but this institution, whether it's a lab, private institution, university, has a really complementary space. And you know, maybe, which is kind of how we went into that conversation, maybe we could actually work together and, and have a better you know, total solution that goes out there, right? So, it, it, you know, doing that benchmarking also may help identify other potential customers or collaborators, if you will, uh, along those lines. Um, sometimes they work out, and, and we kind of went into this one thinking it was going down that path, and then I think they, 
it became obvious that they sort of saw us more as competitors as it. Well, we still got some useful we, information we did, out it, of that it, because, it very you know, we walked into the energy sector thinking our background's infrastructure. We can really talk about how climate change will directly impact power generation facilities and, tr and energy and electric transmission. And talking to them, they were pretty open, like, everyone that we've done work with says that they're significantly more impacted not by generation or transmission, but by demand. And how will climate affect the, the demand as everyone's turned up the dial on their air conditioning during a heat wave? And, you know, e even in the best of times or the worst of times, our infrastructure can't keep up with that. And, and really, everything's being driven by demand, which was great information. And they just openly shared that with us. So, again, it was a bummer that we didn't get to, you know, work with them or that didn't lead to funding. But we still, it was, we still got a lot of great information out of it. And maybe I can. Uh just revisit that slightly. I think if, if you're thinking about it from how do I, uh, you know, do I tack towards what the, the company needs, do I think about being the best, I, I think you can, you can have both, right? I think any engagement that you have with an external entity should be something that builds more value for you over time, right? Your goal should be, I would expect, to be the best at what you do, to be differentiated in some way and to continue to build um, that differentiation and that value in you and then in the lab. Uh, and then any company you work with, you're creating a new piece of intellectual property that makes you even better, right? So it, they, I don't think they are, uh, I don't think they're separate things. I think they're kind of one and the same. I mean, if you're doing a project for an external company that adds no value to you, your science, or the lab, then one questions why you're doing it to begin with. So I guess, I don't know question but more of a comment so in the case of the uh, modeling of environmental conditions uh, what you're offering is not a product uh, it's more of a skill and the question is how to package it in a way that it's attractive to the end user yeah. and the end user like the utility companies in one way they their attitude might be well you know the government funds already paid for obtaining this data and it's modeling and it should be available free right so then the packaging itself so to speak, becomes uh, the, the pay-for service. And, and so kind of like two options, right? Uh, why not think about it as, why, why shouldn't the government agency fund the sharing of the data, like, like a, you know, open source software kind of like style? And second is, why not use a pass-through entity like this competitor that you're talking, put, give the data to them and then they package it in a way that's useful for others. Um, so, so these two things are not clear to me. Like, why is that a bad idea? We, so, uh, the data is already been paid for. So, if we right. give it to the other entity to package it and market it, 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 it's just free for them. Like, we don't. There, there's no. There's no profitability. I think far gone in that. So, the. But, but how else? Like, how else can you make a profit of it? Like profit. So we package the information. So we're 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 doing the additional. So, so the sponsor already generated the, the climate data um, uh, or, or paid for the development of the climate model. Right. And, and so you're absolutely right. like terabytes of data, of climate data, so it's aware. So the one, on the one hand, like it, none of that information is directly useful to an electric utility. Right. Like they, they don't have the expertise to take that, that data and information and, and, and put it in a way that, that could be useful. So what we were marketing was our ability to do that for them and to work with them and understand exactly what their needs are, take the data uh, and, and produce decision support products that could directly support that. In some cases, it was just processing the data and get it to them in a useful format. In other cases, it would be um, doing additional modeling. So how does precipitation, which comes directly from the climate model, how does that translate into uh, surface water runoff and stream flow that could so, so your river. model, your business model would be to uh, to be like a s service provider for each individual utility and have these small uh, contracts with each individual utility rather than just a broadband approach like this is the data and everyone can use it because we packaged it in a way that's useful for everyone? Right, so that's what I started with. So that was the original value proposition was what, like let's package this data and 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 create an online portal where, and, and sort of a clearinghouse for usable, 
climate data and information. And it could be like a, a you know, subscription-based kind of thing or a license-based kind of thing. And because and, um, there's still a lot of work that we have to do to get it to that state that it could be useful to someone, even if it's sort of the raw, raw climate data. Um, but that was, so that's, that's something that's being moved forward a little bit by the sponsor currently who, who paid to, for the model. We're also there, we, EDS is also developing uh, a new climate model that, that's even higher spatial resolution, so it's sort of the next generation of, of this data. Um, so a lot of that's already happening. What we felt was a lot of the value that, that Aragon could bring in addition to that was, uh, you know, we've, we, we have a track record of having done other projects where we've taken that data and worked with a utility or, um, or you know, major metropolitan areas like a mayor's office or, or an emergency operations office um, and, and work with them to figure out exactly the decisions they need to support. Because a lot of them had this sort of oblique idea, we need to figure out how climate change is going to affect what you know, our operations or our systems. So we could help them work through that process, take the data, do some additional modeling or, or whatever else, and, and what we were delivering to them was sort of a decision solution. And, and so your, your point's right, like our, the vision was we could have individual contracts with utilities, but it, it's not like it's, the hope was that those individual contracts could grow into a program with some of those, because some of these utilities are gigantic and cover large swaths of the United States. So, great, we, we, we've now looked at your power generation facilities in one part of the U.S. Now let's look at them in another part of the U.S. Let's look at the transmission system. You know, let's look at the operations. Let's look at the infrastructure. So it could potentially grow into a much larger program with any one of those individual utilities. That was the hope, at least. Did I, that? I, I, yeah, I think the largest um, objection is, yeah, this data is already available, like why should we pay for packaging of it? Like, I, you I think beyond packaging, right? The, the, there's a big gap between, there's a massive pile of terabytes of data, and I know what the hell to do with it. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that was the big thing, right? Is, is out of the climate model, you have, you know, temperature is going to go up by one degree Celsius, let's yeah. say. Mm -hmm. But so what, yeah. what does that mean to me? You know, if I'm, a, if I'm an individual, you know, provider of, of utility, what does that mean to me? It doesn't mean anything to me unless I understand, you know, one degree increase does this to the transmission lines, which means they're going to be less efficient. And they want specifics with stuff. some sort of spatial clarity, right? right? So for, for it to be actual for a utility, they need, they're paying for Tom and the team's expertise, yeah. right? Because they need to go from, here's a big pile of raw data and projections based on that data to, okay, for upstate New York, here's my capacity, here's what can I expect in potential demand curve variability. I need the distribution curve around that, and I need to see what's going to blow up first. That's where I have to deploy capital to fix this, fix that. So when I'm thinking about new solutions to bring onto the grid, what is that going to do? There's all of these problems that they're used to solving those problems. What they're not used to thinking about is um, what are all the impacts of, of a changing climate over time. Well, and, and, and that's kind of like you're differentiating from the competition is what makes you better able to package this data in a usable format than the competitors that you were talking about. Right. Like what yeah. positions you like, and someone would say, no, actually, you're not because you're a national lab. Your your core business in, is in producing models and data, not in solving industry problems. Right. So yeah, and, and, and what we how we said that we how we differentiate ourselves from the private sector competition was um, so, so the, the climate model that Oregon uh, has built and maintained is unique from a lot of the other national labs because it is a it's called a regional climate model which looks at just climate projections for North America. So it's not a global climate model, and it has extremely high spatial resolution. So a global climate model, you're talking you know, 100 kilometer grid squares. The, the current regional climate model that we have is 12 kilometer grid squares. So it's really a lot more detailed. And the one that they're moving towards, uh, which should be done in a year or two, is four kilometers grid squares. So it's really, really high spatial resolution. So at that point, we can start talking about, you know, how what happens in Lamont is, what ha is different from what happens in Oak Brook, which with a global climate model, you can talk about what happens in northern Illinois. 
Uh, and, and not a lot of people have that because you have to have massive computing resources to do that. And a lot of the private sector companies, even the ones that are trying to use cloud computing to do this, um, aren't as successful as, as, as we are at it. So that is just a raw reality of a raw resource that we have that's different from anybody that we're competing with. In addition to that, we have you know, a lot of climate scientists, a lot of engineers, a lot of people with power expertise, all in one organization. So it's not that you know, I'm a municipality and I want to figure out what the impacts are going to be to my wastewater system. I don't have to go work with one group who's doing climate science, one group who's doing um, you know, infrastructure modeling, one group who's doing economic analysis. We have all of that in one organization, so you don't have to, so it's sort of one-stop shopping um, or, or sole source. Where we can't wait to turn those better than one-stop shopping, but I always say one-stop shopping. So that's, that, those were the two major things that, that really do differentiate Oregon from, from everybody else that we were working with, or at least that's the story that we told to everyone else, and I, I for one, believe it. I think we have time for a couple more questions before we wrap up, please. Uh, Jason, you have two great panel, two great winners, but I'm wondering if you can, can share some advice about potentially the don'ts when it comes to raising your value, because I think it's like the stock market. It might also go down if you make some mistakes, and is there, are there certain things we should look out for? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, sadly, I've been on the receiving end of, of that a couple of times. Um, so the, the number one problem tends to be self-delusion. And, and believing your own hype, as it were, right? The, um, wow, I'm the best at this and people should really care about it, regardless of how many people tell you that they don't care about it. Right, so I've, again, my, my most recent venture back to startup was a, was a wild failure um, because we believed that physicians really wanted to pay closer attention to their patients. And let me not make it sound like I'm saying they don't want to do that, uh, but they had the time to do so, that they were willing to spend all this extra effort to ensure their patients uh, followed their instructions and that patients cared to actually be followed and to try to follow those instructions, right? So we built an entire system. It turns out that uh, doctors are so overworked, they're not doing an extra thing um, if they can avoid it, right? They spend all night when they get home charting uh, the, the, the uh, patient um, like sessions they had earlier in the day. They, they're, they're just, they don't, not capable of doing the things that we were expecting of them no matter how much we tried to push. And we spent a lot of other people's money in three years trying to make that work, right? But because we so believed in it, we could not be convinced otherwise. That, that tends to be the biggest failure, right? The, let's say if um, Tom was not very good about uh, being out there and having these conversations, he might still be hawking me, please, please, someone, I've got the best climate data, just you know, open it up, take a look at this terabyte file that you can't even put on your computer, and you'll be wowed and you'll want to spend money here, right? That's, that's the mode that a lot of people get into. They cannot be dissuaded. They're like, oh, I just didn't talk to the right person yet, right? So that's why we always push. You, in many cases, you don't even want to talk about your technology for as long as humanly possible. If you think there's a market that might have a need, you want to show up as kind of the, the newbie and just, I want to learn everything I can about what you do in metal stamping magnet. Sounds fascinating. I'm a researcher at Argonne. I'd love to really understand where the puck is going here, what the big problems are coming down the road. And as you talk to enough of those people, it'll start to become clear, eh, I'm kind of barking up the wrong tree, there's nothing I can really do here. Or, hey, they have a really interesting problem. I've heard this problem from three different people now in three different companies, so it seems to be an actual functional structural problem, and I think I have a way to approach it. And that's the time you start to say, well, what if I could do this? What if, what if we could investigate this particular thing? And you start to tease out what it is that they actually care about. So does that make sense? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the informational interview, and, and we're in a really unique, wonderful position to be able to do that, being, you know, going in and saying I'm a researcher from Argonne is very different than going in and saying I'm a sales guy from company ABC, and I just want to learn from you, right? There's already an immediate bias depending on, you know, you going in and me going in as the company guy, um, and they understand what you're trying to do. and. You know, to Jason's point, that's how you develop your value process. You, you already have in your own mind that, you know, what you do is the greatest thing since sliced bread, obviously. We all do. So, um, so you have in your mind that, that's, that that is the case. What, now what you want to hear is you want to hear other people tell you that without you telling them, right? So you want to hear them.
talking about what their big problems are, what, what the issues in their world are. And, uh, That's kind of the holy grail. That doesn't happen all that often, but when it does, you've, you've struck uh, the yeah. pot of gold, right? That if only someone could solve this very thing, and that happens to be a paper that's about to be published that you've been working on for two years. But don't, don't expect that to happen all that commonly. <laughs> exactly. I will say that um, flying the Argonne flag is very valuable in getting those meetings set up as long as it's seen as non-threatening. Uh, we, we coach all of our teams at UChicago to say accurately that I'm a student at UChicago. I'm trying to learn about this particular market. I'd love to talk to you. Um, the other big thing is flattery. Do not be shy with flattery. So the, the, the three things that, that open up doors the fastest. One, claiming, or you know, rightfully so, that you're a researcher or you're a student, because people are, feel inherently less threatened. Um, two, flattery. I've heard you are an expert in this particular field. Um, I would love to talk to you because I'm dying to learn. People are big fans of flattery. And then lastly, the warm intro, right? So like the, like the best possible cold email is, I'm from Argonne. Um, I met with Jim from this company who said you're the smartest guy in your field and I should definitely talk to you. Uh, you know, you'll have a pretty high success rate of getting in front of them and then just try to peel everything out of their brain that you possibly can. And frankly, um, it's not like you're going to go talk to four of those exact same people and find the thing. The most common thing that, that we see all the time is you'll go talk to those four people, you realize you were barking up the wrong tree, but during the course of those four hours of conversations, you realize that there's something just a few degrees away that's really interesting. Now you got to go find those people. But by the way, the best way to get in front of those people is introductions from the four people you just spoke with. If I can add one thing, just, Please. just build on that. Like I wasted a lot of conversations at conferences uh, by trying to tell other people about how what we were doing was so great. And it took me a while to, to, to fully internalize the message that came through the launch pad of, uh, you know, Tell them what you're doing, and then just listen the whole time. And like, like, was it 80 20? Yeah. 20% like talking, 80% listening. And the better uh, I got at that, the more I was able to sort of rapidly evolve the value proposition based upon what they were telling me. Because it's 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 an, it's natural to want to talk about how what you're doing is so great, but yeah, resist that. <laughs> The, I mean, the, the number one failure point of people going to conferences, they go and they try to pitch themselves to 40 different people. So they spend, you know, 40 different 20-minute chunks of their time just talking about what they do, and then they realize when they're on the plane back home, wait, I am no smarter now than when I left because I literally did not learn anything during the entire conference. I just gave my little elevator pitch 40 times, which I could, I could have done that at home in the mirror and saved myself time, money, and, you know, public embarrassment. So you want to be in listening and learning mode as much as humanly possible. And conferences are a great way to do it just because there's so many people there. You don't have to go chase them down. You don't have to schedule to get on their calendar. You just got to corner them for long enough to start asking that first question. And usually once you get people talking about themselves, your point is it also works the other way. If you can get them talking about themselves, in a, in a, in especially about something they're interested in that they're working on now, um, usually you actually have to try to shut them up. Like it's been 40 minutes. I'm about to miss my... My flight, like, I'd thank you so much. I'd love to follow up. Here's your card, and you gotta, you know, politely excuse yourself. All right. Well, I appreciate all of your time. I hope, hopefully, you got a few nuggets uh, that are useful out of this. Uh, you know, myself, John Haymon are obviously happy to answer any follow-up questions. Tom, I, I won't speak for the two of your time about filling everyone's questions, but please don't be shy if you have follow-up. Take a look at the resources on the sheet that I sent out. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. I have pages and pages of that stuff. Uh, but if any of that seems interesting, I'm happy to bombard you with additional and, and again, answer any follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks. 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 Thanks.